Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Uh, well, we're going to test, test our audience today. Are they enthusiastic today or sleepy? Are you guys ready for some fun? Not bad, not bad. Okay, I'm... <laughs> All right, so anyway, let me introduce myself. My name is Nawal, uh, and I'm a Senior Library Associate for Creative Services, and I'm working alongside with Dustin. Give a round of applause of Dustin. He works so hard today, going in and out, in and about. So we're here at KCH, Night of Columbus Hall. So I remember earlier this year, um, we were talking, me and Dustin is like, what, what kind of program should we do here at KCH? So we were talking about, hmm, why don't we have a talent show? So that idea evolved from having it, want it, wanting to have it as a competition in the beginning to hmm, let's just have it, you know, for everybody to enjoy, everybody to perform without any constraint or making people nervous like crazy up here. I, I forgot how crazy and scary public speaking was until I got here. So anyway, so this is what the library does. Um, we share our resources. We, um, as you know, it's not just tangible products like uh, books and DVDs. We also share expertise. Like what we have today, we have talented individuals like Warren Epstein, stand up and show your face for people. Yeah, a stand up comedian instructor, Ashley Cornelius. Woo! Yeah, that's our Pikes Report Laureate, and also Joe Johnson, our musician at the back there. So these talents at the Pikes Peak region, we would like to share it with all of you. So um, you participate today in our workshop, and I would thank you so much for that. And we can't wait to see you perform today on this stage. Again, another round of applause for them. It's not, not easy, okay? So um, just so you know, um, the place, Night of Columbus Hall, KCH. So here we are at this stage. Um, it is a space where it is open for public, open for community to book it uh, at no cost. We have the hall over here that can fit up 195 people. And we have the mezzanine up there, 17 people, and also the lower level classroom. So all you can do is go to ppld.org and then book yourself there so you can use this space it's a space to thrive you can do performances and whatsoever we have a piano here with you that you can use we have kitchen and we, we have dustin and me here also to help you assist if you have any programs or events that you want to do and since it's open for community i would like to introduce to you one special group that's been using our spot here at kch okay it's called sun mountain taiko a little bit about Sound Mountain Taiko. Coming to work with the drumming is very interesting. It's like me and Dustin will, will talk very fast, and then in the end, okay, it's time for us to be quiet and do our work on the computer because there's no way we can talk and have a discussion when this happened. Okay, so right here, I can say, okay, let me introduce you to the Sound Mountain Taiko. Taiko is a Japanese word for drum. The sticks are called bachi, so you can show the stick. There you go. And can be played on the drum head, the rim, the body, or against each other. Do not knock each other with that. Okay. In the late 1960s, taiko as a musical art form came to North America. It is typically played as an ensemble featuring the Japanese taiko. Many of the songs currently being played in North America are based on festival pieces that celebrate a successful fishing season honor departed loved ones and accompany dancing. Sun Mountain Taiko is a community group based out of Colorado Springs that has been playing together for many years. They often practice in the shadow of Pikes Peak or Tava, hence the name Sun Mountain Taiko. Wow, so ladies and gentlemen, friends and neighbors, give a round of applause for Sun Mountain Taiko!
right, another round of applause for Son Montetaiko! Woot woot! Okay, so first up, we have our instructor, one and only, and she's been actively involved with so many events. You see her everywhere in the Pikes Peak region. Give a round of applause to Ashley Cornelius. All right, hello everyone. My name is Ashley Cornelius. I am the Pikes Peak Region Poet Laureate and I'm so excited to kick off this talent portion of the night. Um, I also want to name that after this, I'm probably gonna have to leave to go to another event. So Noelle is right, I'm all over. So I apologize that I'll probably scoot out after this, um, but I'm so excited to share with you all. So this first piece that I'm gonna perform is what I did for uh, my students earlier, which is called Big Bang Expansive. She is big bang expansive, takes up universal presence, is not colonized by man, emits meteorite laughter. She cries constellations and her smile, supernova combustion. But over time, she learns to be more planet than galaxy. Notices her meteorites are burning up in the atmosphere of his presence, told her body's boundary rings are not welcome between his space told to revolve around someone else's son, sucked into his gravitational pull, told her sonic voice will never escape his black hole. She is eclipsed. Eclipsed by his shadow, she is easy to forget, but she is fireball nebulous. Her solar flares have a way of disrupting his darkness. The speed of light can't escape a black hole and she's never slowed down. She dances northern lights and sings solar system hymns. She fashioned asteroid belt around her milky way and reclaimed her space. Her halo can be seen for light years. Your body is expanding to the outer limit. She is more galaxy than planet. Her meteorite laughter is messing things up. She is big bang expansive. She always has been. Thank you. So the next piece that I'm going to perform for you all is that October is Arts Month, if you did not know. And so there are events every single day. You can look at Arts October or Peak Radar to learn what's happening. This is also one of the events. Um, and so as Poet Laureate, I was asked to commission a piece or write a piece um, for the Arts Month uh, proclamation. So I went to City Council and I also went to the County Commissioners and I wrote this piece about Arts Month. And so now I'm gonna share it with you all. Art is a proclamation of our radiant souls creating unapologetically. Building bridges from tongues disenfranchised to hearts ready to listen. Art is no longer just entertainment. It is a modality for healing, a sacred ritual, a conversation with the community. Our artists are the translators of what adds to the beauty of our region. Blessed are the poets, writers with pens posed to capture fleeting moments, spinning stories grand and epic to be remembered forever. They will find beauty in the mundane details of life, turning and changing of leaves into an odyssey of letting go and transitions, capturing history and metaphors so we may never lose sight of our beginnings, adding meaning when we need it, Tetrising syntax for poetic beauty. Blessed are the painters, brushstroke brilliance, visioners of this land. Depict us in ways where we fall in love with ourselves over and over again. Cartographer of community cohesion, capturing the abstract, the complex, and the joys in pencil, chalk, clay, and even metal. Inspire a dedication to the process, how it's impossible to stay clean when creating and recognizing the mess is a part of the work. They will show us what a better world looks like, textured and dynamic. Blessed are the musicians, symphonic demonstrations of exploration of ourselves, create a sensory experience that vibrates our souls amplify the marginalized and bring their voices high, surrounded with an accompaniment of validation. Honor the offbeats, 
the melodies, the rap lyrics, teach us that harmony sounds like yelling and crying, breathing and laughing. It sounds like authentic self-expression. Conduct us in grace and support of our neighbors. Blessed are the dancers, calligraphy in motion, sharing drama, tragedy, and love, all with a pointed toe. Move the hurt, flew with, move the hurt through with fluidity. They will help us reclaim our bodies, move back into our hearts and minds and make a home. Teach us to move without judgment and give ourselves over to the experiences of radical joy. Blessed are the actors. They will decolonize our movements, teach us theater of the oppressed, guide us in rituals. Utilize our bodies to give thanks and reverence. Teach us how to store blessings more than we do trauma. They will help us take off our masks. The actors will reveal the ways in which our world is all a stage. Allow us to take a bow and shed for the good of the people, for the good of ourselves. Remind us of the emotions we've forgotten we can feel. Act out our fantasies, our dreams, and pains so that we may heal. Blessed are the comedians, bubbling laughter in bellies and willing it to escape in vibrancy. Alchemy, pain, and loss into jokes that aim to heal. We laugh so we do not cry but they teach us that we will laugh until we do cry. They will lead us in a revolution of tight cheeks and wide smiles and delight. May we shelter ourselves in the collective giggles, chortles, and chuckles. We are a blank canvas full of possibilities and potential. Let this month be the invitation for the artist to create to get messy, to pour in our community and fill every inch of empty space, to paint the edges, to collaborate and collage artistic endeavors, record the sounds of artists at work, and dance to it, paint to it, dream to it. This month is an invitation for everyone to engage in one new cultural experience, to reap the benefits of creativity, bridging new possibilities. May we loudly, enthusiastically, and in community, celebrate Arts Month. Thank you. And I have one more for you, and then I will um, head out. Okay, so this last piece um, is my interpretation of the Pledge of Allegiance. I was thinking about what do I want to pledge to, and I realized I wanted to pledge to myself. Um, and so this is something that I read all the time. It's an affirmation um, and a way that I get to re-understand what I want to focus on every day, who I want to pledge allegiance to, and it's me. Here we go. I pledge allegiance to the honoring of every form of this body, and to my ancestors for whom I stand, one goddess, under love, indivisible, with equity and equality for all. I am committed to the protection and maintenance of my temple. I will lay offerings at my feet. I will love and cherish this body in perpetuity. I promise to listen and tend to my needs. I will respect and maintain my boundaries, only speak love and kindness over my body. I dedicate myself to the softening of rough skin and the protection of melanin. I stand guard in defense of my heart. I am at the beck and call of my mental health. I will nurse the wounds of the past and practice radical self-acceptance. Every night, I will light candles in the catacombs of my trauma, honor the parts of me that have suffered, and nourish the survivor I've become. I will accentuate my curves, I will touch my scars often as a reminder that I have overcome and healed. I will openly celebrate and announce my love for this body. I will walk with my head held high, feeling the beauty of my curly hair. I will allow myself a full range of emotions without judgment or fear. I will smile at my reflection and treat myself with respect. I will diligently remind myself that I am enough and I always have been. I pledge allegiance to me. Thank you so, so, so much. 
Thank you. Thank you. Another round of applause for Ashley Cornelius, friends and folks. All right, next up, we are in for a laugh. Give it up for our stand-up comedian, Jason Alexander. You guys doing good? Make some noise for the library. It's great, dude. Yeah, the stand-up class was fun. Um, I did run into uh, my ex-girlfriend's mom. She's not here, you can laugh, it's fine. No, dude, that was like, that was like a really fast way uh, to know that uh, her daughter won the breakup. That was there. She's like, oh, what's he up to? Oh, he's doing stand-up comedy. Well, you won. He's here right now at three on a Saturday. Yeah, man. No, but I'm not doing well. I'm not doing well, like uh, not making lots of money. Like, I realized that I, I'm, like, starting to get more poor because I started grocery shopping at the Dollar Tree. Any Dollar Tree fans in here? Got a couple. That's good. You know? Like how, like how these, 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 uh, these older folk did not raise their hands. You've learned a thing or two. You're above the Dollar Tree, you know? But it's weird. Like, the, the, the thing about, like, my financial status is, like, I'm not like so poor where I would spend like $10 at the pump. But like I am poor enough where like after I'm filling up, I shake the pump like it owes me money. <laughs> like I'm like, oh, yeah. I'm getting every last drop, dude. Yeah, and like, and the thing is with the Dollar Tree is like I had to think about like my process of how I ended up here. Because I went to Walmart, wanted to buy Pop-Tarts. Love a good Pop-Tart. I saw the price of the Pop-Tart. I'm like, that's $5. And I was like, that's too much money. And then I looked at the great value Pop-Tarts, saw that those were $3, and said, that's too much money. So I got in my car and drove to the Dollar Tree and got Toast Up pop -ums, which sounds like someone explaining what a Pop-Tart is in a foreign language. Toast Up pop -um, yes? That's what it is, you know. But like, like I love, I love it. It was. I think the toast of poppins tastes better. I don't even know. Um, try them out. It's good, you know. But I was checking out at the at the Dollar Tree, and I'm scanning my stuff, and I'm at the at the at the pavement window, and I'm like about to swipe my card, and there's a prompt on the thing. It's like, do you want to donate to the children and families that are affected by Hurricane Ian? No, I'm grocery shopping at the Dollar Tree. If anyone needs help, it's me. I swear, I'm this close to getting in my car and driving to Florida. Maybe they're handing out on-brand Pop-Tarts there. You know, uh, but I like milk. Any milk fans? I know that comes as a, as a surprise to no one in here. I look like the world's most lactose-tolerant man. I look like a man who definitely has a favorite kind of chocolate milk. And the answer is Dutch Bros chocolate milk. Have you ever had it? It's literally just half and half in chocolate syrup. By the way, today is my birthday. By the way, this is my birthday. I, and they give you a free drink at Dutch Bros. I have had five chocolate milks today. Large chocolate milks. I shouldn't be allowed to vote. I think that's what I'm saying. <laughs> Anyone that's in that, like... Yeah, dude. All I'm saying is it looked like if Wisconsin became a person. That's what I'm trying to say. You know? Yeah, man. You know, but uh, I do, I do, I, I get in arguments with my friends sometimes, you know? I get back and forth. We were talking about Superman and, like, if he had a good disguise as Clark Kent, you know? Because uh, with the glasses and everything, you're like, well, you'd have his glasses on. They'd be like, oh, he's a reporter. Glasses off, he's Superman. He's like, my friend was like, that's a dumb disguise. No one would fall for that. I'm like, that's not true. I know people will, will fall for that because I use my glasses as a disguise every single day. Because, like, glasses on, you're like, oh, it's like a kind of cute nerdy guy. Glasses off, I look like I eat crayons for the flavor. <laughs> glasses on, Jeffrey Dahmer. 
I hated that show, I'm going to be honest with you, because I, like, just got the glasses, dude. Makes me so mad. Well, the worst part about the whole thing is that, like, I can't even say I look like Jeffrey Dahmer if you watch the show, because he, like, was ripped. I just look like Jeffrey Dahmer if he ate Jeffrey Dahmer. It's a tough go. Like, glasses on, kind Chick-fil-A manager. Glasses off, Arby's manager. No, but I've been Jason Alexander. You guys have been awesome. Give it up for your host, everybody. Um, thank you. Thank you. All right, good job. All right, Jason Alexander. What? All right, so let's start ourselves with some music. And we have Rachel Scott. Hey guys, I'm Rachel. Um, so, obviously, it is Arts Month, and I'm so excited to actually be a part of this. I've always like been like observing it, and I did a few things here and there, but like to actually be performing like myself, that's like absolutely crazy to me. Um, but today, I'm going to be singing "Charming" from the musical um, Natasha Pierre and the Great Comet of 1812. Um, it's <laughs> um, it's a musical based on War and Peace. Um, if you haven't heard of War and Peace, who are you? <laughs> um, oh, well, I have it in my purse. Actually, I just carry around War and Peace. Don't ask why. My brother did, and I was like, I don't know. I, I just have War and Peace. <laughs> um, but to give context to what's happening. Um, the song is sung by Helene, who is Pierre, one of the main character's wife. And she's trying to get the other main character, Natasha, to come to a ball at her house. So she can do some little string pulling with her brother, Anatole, so they can get together. But Natasha, our dear Natasha, she's engaged. So, yeah, we got to do some manipulation. And so I'm hoping to channel that that fun. <laughs> so, hope you enjoy. Oh, my enchantress, how oh, you beautiful thing, charming, charming, oh, this is really beyond. Dresses suit you This one metallic guys Straight from Paris Anything suits you My charmer Oh how she blushes, how she blushes my pretty Oh how she blushes, how she blushes my pretty Charmante, charmante you are such a lovely thing, oh where have you been? It's such a shame to bury pearls in the country Charmante, charmante, charming Now if you have a dress, you must wear it out How can you live in Moscow and not go nowhere? Charmante, 
the world to me. Thank you so much. Rachel Scott, everybody! Woo! All righty then. Okay, to kick off the next set, we have a lot of comedy going on and also singing and poetry. So let's give a round of applause for the first one for this set, our instructor, for stand-up comedy, Warren Epstein! I like to get close. Welcome, everybody. It's been a fun, long day. My students were amazing. Thank you so much. Rodney Dangerfield. This is where I'm from. My wife and I, we were happy for 20 years. Then we met. <laughs> Anybody from New York? Any New Yorkers? It's always best not to have more than one in a crowd. It just, it, it, it's, a, it's a difficult thing. The, the New York attitude is something that's hard to get rid of. I remember the New York attitude being defined for me when I think I was 10 years old and we were driving through the New Jersey Turnpike and they just got in those express lanes so you could just throw it in the cage as you're going 110 and the sign said pedestrians may be killed not kidding and even at 10 I was wondering is that a warning or an invitation <laughs> you don't know it's not very specific so you know obviously Hi. You know, if you could just get that sense of wonder that you could teach me just for a moment. It takes such courage. And with the pink shoes, you got it all going on. Would you like to dance? No, no, we're not into that. Okay. I, I did. Thank you so much, no. <laughs> yes, the, what was I talking about? The New York attitude, hard to, hard to you know, when I, I moved to Colorado Springs, I'll tell you, the, the sense of friendliness here was really difficult for me to deal with as a New Yorker, um, especially, and I see the cups all around, when you go to Dutch Brothers. Have you noticed, like, how do they pack that much friendly into a 12 ounce breve latte. I don't know. But here Gretchen is, and they're always named Gretchen, is leaning out the window. She's practically in my glove compartment. 
and she's got to, along with the drink, she's got to ask, so what are you doing later today? And I always ask, answer the same way, chemo. I don't have cancer, but I am the biggest jerk in the world. I've come from New York, and I'm not going to go there. I just can't bring myself to do that. You know, but you, you get adjusted to a new place, but you see these things around you that are difficult to understand that everybody takes for granted. You all take for granted every day. How many times do we pass Memorial Hospital? But do you ever think about, it's not the most optimistic name for a hospital. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like you're going in for a colonoscopy. They're already measuring you for a coffin. I mean, it's not. And then right next door, of course, you have blunt mortuary. Blunt, we pass this all the time. We think nothing of it. Blunt mortuary, what is this? A, a cemetery for deadheads? I mean, that's a very sophisticated pun, by the way. I want you to break it down for a moment. <laughs> But, but that's where we are. There are all these strange signs. I saw one the other day off Highway 24. Tell me if you've seen this. Wallpapers to go. Wallpapers to go. Like, no, no, I just want them for here. Yeah, that, that pattern. I think that looks great against this wall. But no, no, I'm not going to take it. I just, just want it right there. It's just juicy seafood. Am I the only one? I mean, like sweet steak. I mean, just words that don't... Juicy seafood. I... Hold on. Ah. Would you hand me the water for a second? So speaking of death... <laughs> I'm obsessed with death and... When you live every day feeling like this is your last, which I think is a, is, is a good practice, exactly, <laughs> you feel like screaming. And you go to Costco, and it's such a wonderful thing. You're buying a lifetime supply of everything. Take it home with you. It's a wonderful thing. I have a friend who uh, was dying of, it was a brain tumor, really tough situation. And one of the things he said was tough for him was that not only the pain and the treatments, but that his friends were not visiting him very much because like, you know, you might catch brain cancer from him, right? And he says, except his friend Tony who came over and he says, the first one that treated me right, he said, Charlie, God, your whole life with, a, with such a tiny penis and now this, it's just... But thankfully, I have a wonderful family uh, that helps me get through. Um, my wife is best defined, and this is her. We were on a vacation in Uruguay, and I'm having a bout with the bidet. Has anybody faced a bidet before? It's, it's basically a water pick for your butt, which is a wonderful thing. It's not bad. In some ways, this is a good thing. But there were temperature controls on this one. It was a very sophisticated bidet. A little too sophisticated for me. I am having my butt on fire. And so I reach around, I see a C, I crank it up, not recognizing there's a word for caliente. <laughs> now my butt is tremendously on fire. I jump up, I turn around, now it's hitting me in the face. I, I hear this gale of laughter behind me. And it's my wife, it is her highlight of the vacation is seeing this wonderful scene playing out. And we've, we've had a wonderful time. We're, we're just celebrating our 35th anniversary Monday. Thank you. And we have two wonderful grown kids. Um, our youngest son is now our youngest daughter, came out as trans not long ago. Um, we came back from a vacation. She is dressed there with a dress and high heels, and, and we had, being the progressive parents that we are, our reaction was very sophisticated. It was, but we were in shock for a little while. I, I think I was getting it over, over a little bit 
faster than Jane was, you know, and I, I, she was saying, well, I think it's a little bit easier for you than it, it is for me. I said, why is that? Said, because she didn't just come out of the closet, she came out of my closet. That was my shoes, <laughs> my dress, my jewelry. Yeah, I give her that. And our oldest, Eli, is a photographer in Denver. Wonderful guy, pain in the ass as a kid. Just one of these monster kids, he, especially when he's really young, like three or four. We go to this fancy restaurant. We, we've been tortured by this kid all day, so we want to treat ourselves to a nice meal, but being stupid young parents, we take our child with us. <laughs> and he is literally running up and down the aisle. I said, Eli, I wouldn't do that. Yeah, why? You see that man over there? That's the restaurant policeman. You see the door next to him? That's where they would take you. And I would be so sad. <laughs> He's looking all night at that guy. And we get an hour of peace for dinner. And sure, he's going through intensive therapy, especially after he goes to restaurants, but we had an hour of peace, and if you're a parent, you understand. These days, when I need a, a bit of peace, I just go to Dutch Brothers. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Warren. All right, and thank you for being so cool with the baby. <laughs> she wants to be part of the show. <laughs> yeah, there you go. All right, so let's hang on one second. Something going on here. Okay. Okay, next up we have Mame for Poetry. Give a round of applause for Mame. Perspective. That isn't fair, she exclaimed. Look, your glass is half full while mine is half empty. Okay, I'll trade you, I volunteered, politely refraining from pointing out that I was drinking tap water while hers was pink champagne. Dysfunctional relationship number 64. She spilled her guts all over the carpet, hoping he would tell her it was okay, that he really didn't mind the mess. But he immediately went for the vacuum cleaner, followed by vigorous scrubbing with enzymes. A lot of my poems are, are birthed out of actual conversations I've had with people. This one actually happened over 20 years ago. Waiting for my omelet, I asked the woman at the next table where she had gotten her beautiful vest. By the end of breakfast, she had told me how her, all of her ex-boyfriends had maxed out her credit cards and about her stingy, wealthy father who wouldn't help her out because he was teaching her a lesson. But she was going to teach him one by filing charges against him for assaulting his 35-year-old daughter. Then she went on to rant about how exploitative all the rich people here in Sedona are and how the tourists just play right into it and how the American ice skating dynasty is run by a bunch of elitist snobs and they gave Tanya Harding a bum rap and how the hotel and restaurant management school in Flagstaff was a ripoff and was just preparing their students to take minimum wage jobs and be exploited and blah, 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 vent fume rage. I wanted to know where she got her cool red boots, but was afraid to ask. <laughs> Thank you. This is called Hope Deferred. Sometimes hope 
is a vivid dream from which you pray you will never awaken. Sometimes hope is a roller coaster ride that ends too soon and dumps you out into the mud. Sometimes hope is a first class ticket to the Titanic and you just can't resist standing in that line over and over again to buy more. For a few short days, the heart sings, yes, giddy with possibilities, alive and resonating with courage to believe that dreams can come true, that maybe at last prayers are being answered after all. Why did you ever doubt? Sometimes hope is a baby bird opening its mouth wide to receive a beak full of dry sand. Sometimes hope is a ladder propped against the wall of a deep, dark hole, but it isn't quite tall enough to get you out over the top. Sometimes hope is a star so very distant it seems irrelevant. Sometimes hope is a longing with no place to go. This is called Taking Flight. What is it makes some people cower in a ditch, unable to try, watch from a distance, while other people fly like they've never even heard of gravity? What is it makes some souls hold fast to the earth, clutching bare survival, blind to their worth? while others don't waver, push through metal bars, never thinking to question their place among the stars. What is it makes some spirits wounded so deep, unable to rise above except in their sleep, while others soar through the sky, unaware they have no wings, yet they fly. I have one more. This is called 14. I am 14 and painfully shy. I feel too much. I have passionate crushes on boys who don't know I exist. Standing by the wall at a dance, I'm careful not to make eye contact not to let them see how desperately I want to be chosen, never guessing they need my smile to give them courage. Only the ones lacking in social skills ask, I wonder what's wrong with me? I'm sure there's a spotlight shining down on me in a banner that says, reject, loser, unworthy. I'm 14 and painfully shy. I feel too much. I have passionate crushes on boys who don't know I exist. I don't know the steps. I watch others do them, and it looks like fun. But however hard I try, my feet just will not do what I tell them to. I feel ridiculous, laughable. I am 14 and painfully shy. I feel too much. I have passionate crushes on boys who don't know I exist. I'm sure they know when they hold me close how vulnerable I am how out of control I feel. I am 41, cultured and sophisticated. I still feel too deeply. Rarely I meet men who stir up something inside me. Occasionally I hear that some man was interested after the fact, after he's safely in a relationship with someone else. I didn't think, you're, I didn't think you were interested, says he. I would have been. My friends love to dance, but I pretend not to enjoy it, while secretly wishing someone wonderful would ask and have the patience to teach me. Once in a great while, I let friends drag me to a dance, and once again, I am 14 and painfully shy. I feel too much. <laughs> Thank you. That is meme, everybody.
Thank you so much for performing today. And next up, we have Ellie up on stage for a stand up comedy. Hi, everybody. Name just made me cry, so this is going to be fun. <laughs> How is everybody? Good. I gotta tell you, I'm pretty nervous. This is my first time ever doing anything like this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But I feel like the bar has been set, so I'm gonna be fine because as long as I don't come up here and show you a Dollar Tree badge and tell you I'm a cop, I'm gonna be fine, I'm gonna be fine. <laughs> he really did that, y'all. So I do have to ask that you be respectful to me, though, because I have to tell you I was at a birthday party at Burger King last week, and they gave me a crown, so I am now queen of the realm. <laughs> Just kidding. We know that America doesn't have queens that can read stories to children, um, and neither does the UK anymore. <laughs> Oops. No, but there, there was some good that came out of that, because apparently right after the queen died, the national anthem felt free to change its pronouns. See, you can do it, you can, it's fine. Um, king Charles, this is something I didn't know until recently, maybe you did. He's really into homeopathy, did you guys know that? Do you know what homeopathy is? Okay, so homeopathy, for those who are not familiar, it's like you take an ingredient for like a medicinal purpose, right? but it's usually the opposite of what you would think. So like, okay, I'm from Waco, Texas, so let me tell you this joke. It's like, if you wanna make a biker behave, you take meth and you dilute it in water and dilute it and dilute it and dilute it till so there's no trace of meth. And supposedly be given the water, that's gonna work, I don't know. But in the UK they have homeopathic hospitals even, and I'm like, that's cool. Is that like how you guys call a biscuit a cookie? Cause like over here we call those swimming pools. <clears throat> Thank you, that's very kind. And like it works for like, they have meters and we have yards and they have millimeters or whatever that crap is. And it works for like units of time too. So I don't know if you guys heard, but uh, their prime minister just resigned after what, 44 days, is that what it was? 45? Crap, I gotta do math now, okay. Uh, we'll just pretend it's 44. Uh, and I, we have, the, 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 sorry, the British press over there, they're making like all these jokes about how now that's a unit of time is a truss, it's 45 days. Uh, and we can do conversions to, in, to like imperial measurements. That would be about 3.3 scaramoochies, I think. But I still, I'm sorry, I can't get over this homeopathic thing. I'm sorry, I can't. What's next? Are they going to have like homeopathic police? Like I'm chilling and all of a sudden it's like, police. And I'm like, oh my God, what the heck? And I'm like in the middle of a bath. So I'm like putting on my bathrobe and they're like, like what is the problem? They're like, what are you doing in that tub full of homeopathic methamphetamine? Thank you guys, you're great. note we have Janae Jackson hi guys <laughs> um, so I'm technically a writer technically it's what I tell everybody so I'm just gonna hold this like my security blanket um, I won't take notes on how you respond um, so I've been coming out of COVID isolation like we all have and I've been kind of thinking that you know, I'm the only one, and it's such a comfort to find out that I'm really not. We're all discovering that, oh, I really am an introvert, and um, I, I feel like we have to kind of reorient ourselves, you know, with how, um, like, relearn some skills, right? I've always been very socially skilled, but dang awkward now, man. And one of the things that I've been really afraid of is that my inner bitch, um, has more freedom now because she hasn't 
had to be chained. Um, I do have an inner bitch. Uh, I was raised to be nice with a capital N, a preacher's daughter. Um, you're not allowed to express any negativity or anger or anything like that. And yet in isolation, I've been doing a lot of therapy <laughs> and realizing that my inner bitch is fine. Like, she's okay, she can have a life. But I don't quite understand how that's gonna intersect with people I see every week or every day, you know. One place in particular that she's always been able to live is inside my car, <laughs> okay. So, if you've ever ridden with me, you know that it's, it's an experience. And it's because I started cussing when I was 30, and I decided to learn, and I decided to practice inside my car. Now, I also happened to have a child that same year. <laughs> and so it was a juggling act all the time. Cussing, learning to cuss, um, I call my car my rage sink, like a heat sink. It's where all of my rage, all of my frustration, it all lives. And it's changed lately because I've been teaching my 16-year-old how to drive. Um, does anybody have kids? Has anybody taught a teenager how to drive? <laughs> um, He's at the awkward moment where he thinks he knows everything, and so I have to couch everything in very respectful, coach-like terms. Right now, we're just working on the nuances, honey. You're doing great. But every one of my kids know that I have three rules, in particular, that they must follow. So the first is pay attention. Now, it's not pay attention like the manual tells you. It's pay attention to what's actually going on all around you. And it comes out, I mean, it does produce rage. <laughs> I didn't know that paying attention produced rage um, until I was on a, a road trip with my friend, and she just observed the whole time. Um, we're still friends which is amazing. <laughs> um, she said, the reason you rage is because you notice about 10 times as much as most people when they're driving. And I, that didn't make me feel better because it made me more scared to drive. I don't know, I don't know how to live if everyone is paying attention one-tenth of what I'm paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> That's really, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm afraid that people are going to die all the time. Um, the second is called the zipper. Now, does anybody know what the zipper is? Okay. Now, no, there are only three people who said they know what this is, even though it is on the Department of Transportation's website. Um, it instantly produces rage in me because it's, it, it makes so much sense. So here's, I want you to notice this the next time you're on the road. You have a merge, there are two lanes, and so often our dear people, um, they make the merge end just after a traffic light. Have you noticed that that's usually? So what happens is everyone sees the merge and they get in the left lane. And they start, they, and so it backs up about three miles in one, with everyone in one lane. The zipper means, and they use this all over the world, what you're supposed to do is everyone goes forward in both lanes, and then at the very end, you just alternate in a very polite and gentle and logical <laughs> way. Now those of us, and I'm including you because now you know, those of us who know the zipper are the assholes <laughs> who stay in the right lane until the beginning <laughs> of the, until the merge and everyone is honking. They're all mad at you because you didn't follow the rules. And I'm inside my rage sink, <laughs> inside my car, and it's the only time, the only, the only way the rage sink works for me is that, is if I can't 
if I don't communicate my rage. Like, the windows have to be up, and I can't know that they saw me. Like, sometimes I'll be like, ah! But, you know, I can't, I can't communicate it unless they've been really, really unsafe. If they're really unsafe, I will hunt you down. Like, yeah, I, Mama Bear comes out. Um, I once called uh, a company to tell on their driver because they blew through all of the, the pedestrian walkways on Cascade. Um, I think I got him fired. Um, so the zipper, <laughs> yeah, so the zipper, thank you. So the zipper, just the only thing that I do is I did I roll my window down, I'm about to merge, and I stick my hands out the window and I go, come on! Yeah. And they never, you know, I still get in trouble. The last and third rule is just one sentence, guys. Allah, the Stark King from Game of Thrones. It is not blinker than breaks. So <laughs> I messed it up. I told you I don't do jokes. <laughs> it is not breaks than blinker. All together now. It is blinker than breaks. Okay, that's. <laughs> Alrighty then, I'm probably the person that was like waited three miles on that zipper. Th yeah, yeah, I know. All right, so let's hear another music from our wonderful participant, Sharon Gaydon. Well, good afternoon. It's nice to see everybody here. My name is Sharon Gaydon. And uh, I'm tangled up. Here we go. All right. And um, I'm just pleased to be here with you this afternoon. And I'm hoping that I can bring you back into some past music experience. I'm looking around. And I see, I bet some of you can remember Patsy Cline. Yes? Oh. Well, during the break, believe it or not, I am a, an avid Patsy Klein fan, but I didn't know this about her until the break. Uh, the song Crazy, which is one of her most popular ones, was written by Willie Nelson, and he wanted specifically her to sing it. And she was just recovering from having been in a, an airplane accident, or I'm sorry, it was a, a car accident this time. I'm sorry, the plane is what did her demise. Um, and uh, so she had some rib problems and was having a hard time breathing. Well, today I can relate to that, and I hope you can too. This is part nerves, but it's also part long haul COVID. I was hospitalized for 26 days with COVID last December, and I'm still on oxygen at night. But today I am going to sing for you, Patsy, and her favorite song, and maybe I'm crazy. Ready. Crazy, I'm crazy for feeling so lonely. I'm crazy, crazy for feeling so blue. I knew. As long as you wanted And then someday You'd leave 
me for somebody new. Worry, why do I let myself worry? Wondering, what in the world did I do? Thinking that my love could hold you I'm crazy for trying And crazy for crying But I'm crazy for loving you Crazy for thinking that my love could hold you I'm crazy for trying and crazy for crying and I'm crazy for loving you You're wonderful. Thank you. There you go. All right. Okay, we are almost there at the end of our show. We have three more performances. So without further ado, let's give a round of applause for our next contestant, participant, Hans. Hi, hi, yes, so my name is Hans, I'm here to read some poems, and initially I was going to read one poem, and when uh, Mame was reading, I said, she's got a whole bunch of poems. <laughs> so, I realized I have a lot of poems on my phone, so, anyway, I've got a few more, but this one I wrote today during the workshop. Um, <laughs> And, well, and, and then after, I, I, I tried to touch it up a bit, so we'll see. It doesn't have a title. I, 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 I listened to Robert Frost read some of his poems, and he didn't read the title. So, I mean, like, if that was the only record of the poems, the titles would be lost, right? So I'm not going to read a title that's not there. So, um, <clears throat> And even a person in a position to know better says, I like jazz because it's relaxing. The calm of jazz to some is to entice one's hidden gentleness, to come to jazz, to the rest, with vulnerable ears, that the cacophony of Max Roach with Anthony Braxton in their piece, birth, might better strike and batter unlike any symbols heard before. The enticing jazz hides a snare. Jazz can be more deadly than death metal, more dangerous in the right hand, and domesticated by the left. Each hand, like the drummers, knows what the other is doing, and the feet can tread lightly or expand into a force to stand over the world to pass judgment. I like jazz, gentle jazz. It holds my heart, holds my fears and moans in abeyance. And it has a big, big muscled elder which defends me against the cruel, the caddish, and the courtly. There is even quiet gentleness among the aural violence of the sax attack, the tenor that makes the earth tremor and the air fill with flack. Say you love jazz because it's gentle. Know its diplomacy invites to the celebratory crash of splash 
crash, ride, hi-hat. The blare and snarl of Selmer brass. The calls of ghosts haunt the dolmen and flower field of gentleness. Listen to jazz. Thank you. Thank you. And I wrote this one for somebody who had uh, lost somebody else. I think this is the one. It was kind of like a year or two ago, so I'm not sure if I even remember it. Let's see. But uh, uh, this one has a title. It's titled Reach. And, you know, I'm going to skip the first line because it's better that way. Through dreams in lee of calm behind the stone, Grasmere's happy veil consoles us among our own, apart no more, nor fearing death would knock upon the door. As humble flesh, we are each our own. Still breezes tease us and the sea where on the beach we lay a solstice day beneath the gull beside the shell. A wave would reach and not quite reach our feet. I think of this where I would like to meet a friend not seen for year and year to save a thing beyond a thing that silence in the fray. The grains escaped as yours pose grasp. A grain of sand, two hands to clasp. Thank you. Whoa, thank you Hans, and I love jazz by the way. All right, we're up for one last laugh. Timothy McKenna, here we go. Okay, I hope you don't mind if we get stupid and silly for a moment. Oh, God. I knew Warren was going to say that. Okay, my name is Timothy, and the first thing I want to say is thank you for staying. Uh, as the poem performers that already performed that didn't just cut and run after they got their moment of glory. No offense to them. Now, I have to tell you, um, <clears throat> I'm going to kind of dupe you here. I didn't come up to do comedy. I came up to talk to you about Amway. Who's not happy in their perfect job? Actually, I'm from Kansas. My name is Timothy. Thank you. Thank you, Kansas. Okay, yeah. Kansas is actually an old Pawnee Indian term for many uh, cows farting or something. I don't know, Pawnee. I'm guessing. I have no idea. Um, I, uh, I don't know if you know Kansas. It's a beautiful state if you like tornadoes. We got so many tornadoes in Kansas. Our state bird is actually the cow. <laughs> That's a good job. <laughs> I'm a budding author, which means I smoke a lot of bud, and I think this is going to be a great story idea. But I always forget it. I never write it down. Never. I'm still a published author. I got a sex ed book for coming out uh, for kids. Uh, my agent tells me in the spring. It's a pop-up. Up. Did we go too far? He also called and said, by the way, you have a book of rabbit jokes coming out right after that. And I was like, Dude, there's no way. I only sent you two rabbit jokes. <laughs> Did everybody get it that's going to get it? Okay. 
I got fired from my last uh, job in a bookstore for um, practicing self-help in the self-help aisle. <laughs> it said self-help. I was doing my... Oh, darn it. So, um, <laughs> my ex and I broke up over a book exchange, which is really weird reason to break up. She was reading too much Cosmo. I don't know. Anyway, we were still supposed to do this book exchange, and she gave me one that's very helpful. It's a great book, Men and Women in Conversation. I gave her one called, Why Are We Still Yapping and Not Having Sex? Well, there you go. Uh, I was driving down the road the other day, and I saw a sign that con confused me. It said, my daddy works here. Please slow down. So, of course, I slowed down to, you know, 55 or so. I hit a couple of guys. But I can't tell whose daddy is whose out there. You need bigger name tags, is what I'm saying. <laughs> okay, thanks. I love that joke. Thank you very much for laughing at that. So here's three great ideas that haven't happened yet. The Starbucks coffee trough. You're late for work. Come in, dunk your head in, slap it back, you're off. <laughs> Two, the Denny's feed bag. We know you're drunk. Strap it on, oh come on. <laughs> like Joe doesn't know this one. Three, sex flavored pop rocks. What's the holdup? Why haven't they happened? <laughs> okay, did you guys know that three out of five dentists actually recommend the fifth dentist? <laughs> Thank you. I love that. I like that one. If I had been asked for a quarter for every time I'd been asked for a dollar on the streets, okay, I've done the math. I'd have all those quarters less than I gave away as dollars on the streets, plus all the quarters that I made in my job, less all the ones that were in the couch. <laughs> That's a non sequitur, thank you so much. Okay, here's three things I never wanna hear again. No, stop, you're hurting me. That one was wrong. <laughs> Number two, Madonna. Number three, no. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess I should tell just one last joke here, which is going to be really stupid. I bought an electric car because I got a friend down the road. And he was like, you're going to save like so much money on gas if you convert this. And then I got my electric bill. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for supporting local talent. And God bless Pedro's Public Library, PPLD. Thank you so much. I'm Timothy. Yeah, thank you, Timothy. Another round of applause. All right, for our last performance, last but not least, our musical maestro. Here, give it up for Joe Johnson. How you guys doing? Me too. Thanks everybody for coming today. Um, what an awesome group of uh, performers. I, I know I speak for my fellow uh, instructors today in saying it was a real honor to uh, work with all you guys. Um, all of you are awesome. Um, Janae, I learned to curse a long, long, long time ago when I was very, very young, but my kids learned to cuss from me teaching them to drive. So it's really, <laughs> I felt like we were on the same page almost. So, 
Um, I'm going to do a couple of songs or so. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Is this thing on? Is this thing working? Okay. Do you guys remember that weird period of time where no one could leave your house and we all had to sit there and do nothing and we watched a lot of TV and we were staring at our phones all the time? Yeah, that sucked. I was home the whole time. So all I did was write. I wrote lots and lots and lots of songs during the two weeks that we weren't allowed to do anything. And uh, the other thing that I did was I spent a lot of time on social media, which is where I saw all of you. Um, and I, I took note of how everyone sort of responded and reacted to all the things that were going on. And um, <clears throat> between social media and the news, uh, that's where this came, song came from. Uh, this kind of was my... Um, my look at at that time and just our general uh, need to be entertained as a society I feel like we're very much an entertain me based people entertain me uh, as evident by the fact that we've done an all-day class on how to entertain uh, so this song is uh, one that I, that I wrote kind of about that. It's called On and On It Goes, and it combines elements of comedy, poetry, and performance. All in one three and a half minute package. It goes like this. Sometimes strikes, sometimes gutter, sometimes you eat the cow, sometimes you squeeze the udder, sometimes I use oil, sometimes I use butter. How come everybody can't love one another? You tell me because I don't know, but it seems like to be a better way to go. Instead of running around scared of things that we don't know, turn on the TV to our favorite show. It's the one about the woman and the fella and the friends and the hilarious shenanigans that they get in. One loves the other, the other loves another. And on and on it go. On and on it go. Like a Midwest where the prairies roll. It's a fantastic waste of all my precious time. On and on. It goes. Well, I heard a friend talk about the current situation of the world as he heard it on the radio station. He said they said everything is going down the drain. You better get it right before it gets too late. I said, I believe you underestimate this stubborn old world. It ain't going away for five billion years till the sun burns up. So pour some more wine in your solo cup. Turn your radio up. Put your windows down and play your music loud for the whole damn town. Till the cops show up and they haul you out. And on and on it goes. On and on it goes Like a Midwest where the prairies roll It's a fantastic waste of all my precious time On and on it goes Tim McKenna whistle solo, here we go, where'd it go? That's terrible, man. Absolutely atrocious. Ah, uh, that is not a whistle. Warren Epstein, whistle solo. Here we go. That sounds so much better. Sorry, Tim, you're fired. You're out of the band. I ain't trying to preach and I ain't trying to pry. I probably couldn't change a mind if I tried, but I can change a light bulb and I can change a tire. I change my pants one leg at a time. 
just like you if you change yours too like i said i ain't here to tell you what to do i'm just here to tell a story sing a song or two i used to drink liquor and i might still do i used to be dumb till i got me a clue i used to feel sad till i learned to feel blue i used to be lonely till i found you and on and on it goes and on and on it goes Like a Midwest where the prairies roll It's a fantastic waste of all my precious time And on and on it goes it's a fantastic waste of all my dwindling time and on and on it goes yep. thank you thank you very much thank you to all my fellow caucasians out there that took half a song to get the rhythm right i love it thank you for that um, I'm going to do another song. Um, this one I'm not going to play guitar on, and I'll tell you why. It's because I can't hear it at all, but that's, a, that's okay. Uh, there's not a monitor here, and I'm used to having one of those. But that I don't need the guitar for this song. It's an a cappella song. Um, so I was here to talk about uh, performance, and I got to work with these two amazing ladies who just tore the house down. Give them a hand for singing, yes, yes. And so the thing about, thing about performance, okay, and we discussed this, is uh, it's very important. How many of you weren't a part of the workshops that just came for this show? Great, you didn't hear this already, cool. So the, <laughs> the thing about stage fright, right, is that, that energy we get that makes us unsure if we should get up on that stage or not. The key, what I feel like, is not, it, it's not to ignore that that exists or to try to somehow vanquish it like a dragon. No, the key is to saddle that thing like a horse and learn how to use it and learn how to turn that energy into your performance. Now, a good example of this, uh, in it, I can give you from my life. Uh, just a little over a week ago, uh, I competed in what is known as the International Blues Challenge, okay? And it is blues players from all around the world and all across the United States um, compete. And uh, I competed in the Southern Colorado competition. I was asked to do this because no one from Colorado Springs entered the competition, and the competition was here in Colorado Springs, and they said, we need someone to compete, okay? And I'm not a competitive musician person. I'm, I was the last person picked for volleyball. I was the, uh, the kid who skipped gym class, so I didn't have to climb a rope. I am not competitive. I don't do these things, and I did not want to do this, okay? But I agreed to do it because I live here, and I appreciate this community, and I wanted to do something to represent it. So I went to this competition, and I show up, and the room is full of some of the most amazing blues performers I've seen in years, and they had very nice suits with sharp hats and wingtip shoes and their guitars were all polished, not like mine, where it's full of marks and, and little scratches and holes, and I haven't cleaned it in months. Not, not like me. These were, these were professionally put together musicians. And here I come in my blue jeans and my T-shirt, and, and, and they're looking at me thinking, this guy's not going to win. And I'm looking at them thinking, this guy's not going to win. And, you know, and so all I could, I was just, I was very nervous to do this, okay? And I thought to myself, I can't compete with these guys. I'm, I'm not a great guitar player. You know, I can't get up there and just rip these guitar solos. What I can do 
is sing a song that I wrote and try to do something dynamic that they won't be able to forget, that they'll at least say, I know that guy was there, whether he won or not, you know? And oops, I won the damn thing, uh, which is wild. Um, and uh, so in January, I, I will be going to, uh, at the end of January, I'll be going to Memphis to relive this nightmare over and over for five days. Um, and it's crazy. Um, but anyway, uh, so what I did was I took all of that fear and, and uncertainty about who I am and what I bring to the table in the face of these great performers, and I instead just channeled it into my performance, into the song that I'll sing for you now. So this is the song that won me the competition, okay? And uh, I'm going to yell at you for a minute while I do this song, but I'm not going to play guitar. So uh, this song is uh, a song I wrote about, uh, during Prohibition, there was an alcohol that is called Jamaican ginger, okay? And uh, it was uh, widely distributed um, in the black market all across the United States, okay? And uh, people called it Jake, Jake Liquor, okay? And the problem with Jamaican ginger, Jake Liquor, is that it affects your nervous system if you drink too much of it. And what happens is you, you, you will lose the use of one of your limbs, either your arm or your leg or something. And so a lot of people were seen sort of walking and dragging their foot as they walk. And they, they had a term for it called Jake leg. And so when you saw someone with Jake leg, you knew that was a drunk. There's an old drunk over there, been drinking that Jake. So I thought, I, I learned about this story and it was just fascinating to me. And so I wrote this song and it's called Jake Leg Blues. And it goes like this. If whiskey was a woman, Lord, I never would stray. Love that woman till my dying day. Till my dying days. Till my dying day. Down in Johnson City, the Appalachian Mountains, where the starlight and moonshine runs clear and stout. John Law said the leg will do you none but wrong. But it's been feeding my family for 10 years done gone. So they got their warrants. Now the wells are dry. Got the boot hills planted in a good man's eye. In the good man's eye, Lord, in the good man's eye. Now when you need your liquor, mm, like the flowers need a ray, no, it take most anything, guess you right again. About that time, come on, Jay. Mm, nah, he's a mean old hound. He's guaranteed for the put you six feet to the ground. The preacher man said a sin that brought the thing to you. But oh, pretty soon that old preacher, he's walking Jake leg too. He's walking Jake leg too. He's walking.
walking jack leg too to see me walking slow with my cane in hand take another shot of poison for the common man I said prayer for the wicked before our time is through I keep one eye open for they do it to you lay down my body oh, Be my dying bed. Be my dying bed. Oh, and I'll be my dying bed. I'll be my dying bed. Let that Jake leg blues be my dying bed. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. That made me sweat. Hey, listen, y'all. Thanks. I appreciate you. It's been a real honor to be here. Thanks, Noel and Dustin, for putting this on and for letting me be a part of it. And Warren, I love you, buddy. Hey, thanks. And that's why he won. <laughs> yes, thank you so much for representing all of us from Pikes Peak, from Southern Colorado to that competition. And I bet next time all of you could be in one of those competition too. Maybe, who knows? Yeah. All right, again, thank you so much for coming everybody. I would like to thank everyone. I would like to thank the instructors. Uh, Warren Epstein, thank you so much. Joe Johnson, and uh, thank you for participating for our workshop and also at our talent showcase again uh, we thank you for your feedbacks and hopefully we'll see you again next year right right Woo! okay so don't forget to check out ppld.org for more events happening here at ppld across the board all right thank you again and have a wonderful weekend wonderful night and thank you so much for coming everybody